Okay, I think we're going to get started. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We're very pleased today to welcome Sarah Lacey to the Google San Francisco office as part of the Authors of Google program. Um, Sarah is here today to discuss her book, Once You're Lucky, Twice You're Good, The Rebirth of Silicon Valley and the Rise of Web 2.0, or 2.0, or we can debate about it. 20. Exactly. Okay, or that. <laughs> so the cool kids call it. And um, Sarah is a uh, no, is a award-winning journalist, and she's also uh, currently writes a column for Business Week, as well as um, ha is the co-host of Yahoo Finance's Tech Ticker. She lives in San Francisco. She's a denizen of Potrero Hill, but soon to be a denizen of the Mission. And please help me welcome Sarah Lacey to the Authors of Google San Francisco event. Thank you. Well, it's really fun to be here um, for a lot of reasons. One, I didn't have to commute to Mountain View on one of my few days I don't have to drive to Yahoo. But also because I don't know if you guys all realize in the publishing world how much it's changed. Like, they don't even do readings anymore. They don't really do traditional signings. It's sort of press and parties because they used to send you to all these bookstores and like three people would show up to buy a book and you'd be trekking all over the place and it just you know wasn't worth it. So places like Google are like the only places where you actually can do real readings and, um, and signings. So this is really exciting for me. I actually haven't read any of my book to anyone other than myself out loud. So, um, so this is really exciting. So um, just you know, a word about sort of how I started um, to, to work on the book, and then I'll go through a couple of things, and then I'd love to take questions. Um, you know, my basic observation was that everyone, I, I moved to Silicon Valley in the bubble. I was fascinated by, I covered finance. And I was fascinated by venture capital and how it worked and startups. And um, I wanted to go to the place where it was all happening. And as soon as I got here, you know, everything crashed. <laughs> and, um, you know, I stuck with it because I was still, I actually thought it was a more interesting time to be covering the web and venture capital as there was this shakeout happening, as people were building real businesses in the hardest time possible. And even though I worked for places where my editors weren't necess didn't necessarily care about it, I still kept in touch with a lot of people and followed it. And I don't think a lot of other people did that. And so when we got to the point where um, all of a sudden we were hearing about MySpace and YouTube and Facebook all the time, um, a lot of people didn't get a sense of where this wave of companies had come from. And you know, everywhere, time I would talk to people outside of Silicon Valley or even inside Silicon Valley, people would always say, you know, are we in 1999 again? And I'm sure that you guys know this because you, we work in the internet. It's, it's incredibly different than 1999 in a lot of ways. And so I felt like there was this huge gap in understanding about how, where this wave of internet companies came from. And um, a lot of the guys behind them had gotten so burned from being these poster children of the internet in the 90s, they didn't really want to talk to reporters. and They didn't want, really want to tell their story. So I found myself in a position where I had a unique opportunity of having access to these people who were building what I thought were more socially transformative companies than what we had actually seen in the bubble. And a lot of the companies that really fulfilled a lot of the initial promise of the web. And I, I felt like I was in a unique position to write a book telling their stories. So. Um, I wanted to do it in a really narrative style so it would read like a novel so people totally outside Silicon Valley and outside the scene um, would find it interesting and it wouldn't feel like work. So I focused on a handful of guys and spent about a year um, just following them around everywhere and interviewing them and going to their offices and um, I mean literally spent hundreds of hours with the people in the book. Um, my average interview in one sitting was four to six hours at a time. I have no idea why these really busy people granted me all this access to this day. But um, the result has been this book which I think is a very personal story um, from their point of view um, and, and really breaks a lot of the misconceptions of what web entrepreneurs are really all about. So um, to start out, I, you know, I had to do a lot of scene setting because there was this observation that people just m remembered the bubble and the bust incorrectly. So I want to just start out reading a couple pages from the end of um, the prologue to the book, you know, just in case uh, you know those of you in the room don't don't remember exactly how horrible it was either. The fact that every company and practically every person was caught up in the newest tech craze would make the crash far more disastrous than anything Silicon Valley had seen before. And it wasn't just the jobs or money lost, which were staggering in and of themselves, but the psychological impact as well. On the way up, the internet was the first invention on the scale of the television or the car that people had seen in a long time, maybe ever depending on their age. 
It was a new way to communicate, find out information, be entertained, and buy things all rolled into one. It was mind-blowing. So mind-blowing you could see it revolutionizing nearly any industry. And the businesses being built were relatively easy to understand because they were primarily just digital forms of things we already knew, such as newspapers or catalogs or banks. We were all seeing the world change before our eyes, seemingly faster than it ever had before. When the NASDAQ peaked at 5132.52 midday on March 10, 2000, and started its slow, painful descent to less than 1,200 two years later, it took with it the promise of lucrative IPOs and acquisitions for half-baked ideas and business plans. It also took a chunk of people's savings and many young people's careers. But worse, it took all of that hope and optimism, too. That optimism was so powerful that it wasn't immediately clear it was all over. People, especially those in Silicon Valley, took a long time to realize just how bad it would get. The new economy had seemed so real that it took months, years for all that optimism to be beaten out of the valley. Week after week in 2001, industry magazines such as the Red Herring and Industry Standard would feature experts explaining why a tech resurgence was just a quarter or two away. They would tout out new sectors as the as the ones to pick up where the internet had fallen off. Biotech, nanotech, and wireless each had a turn as the supposed new thing. As people watched friends and loved ones lose jobs, favorite companies go under, they all wanted to believe these next waves really could turn things around. But nothing had the same mojo as the great information superhighway. In mid-2001, a red herring headline seemed to say it all. How much asterisk, exclamation point, percent sign, ampersand, longer. <laughs> by, both by 2002, both the red herring and the industry standard would be out of business, laying off hundreds and adding to the carnage in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. According to the economic group, the Bay Area Council, the Bay Area lost 450,000 jobs, the equivalent of the entire working population of San Francisco today. In one day during the summer of 2001, JDS Uniface and Hewlett Packard laid off a combined 13,000 people. The devastation involved everyone. Dot coms, yes, but also the older tech companies who had staffed up to catch the internet wave. There were networking companies like Cisco and Nortel Networks. There were the phalanxes of journalists, investment bankers, lawyers, accountants brought in to service all this activity. Most of them lost their jobs. Many moved away. This human toll in the pall that hung in the air for years is what people in San Francisco remember most. It made the bust intensely personal. In most circles, for every millionaire you knew, you knew dozens of people out of work, emotionally crushed and scarred. For a time, many people couldn't even get a job waiting tables. If you weren't laid off yourself, you watched it happen. You sat there on a tense Friday afternoon, watching your boss call your friends and coworkers into his or her office one by one. Sometimes they would leave mad, sometimes defiant, sometimes in tears. They all got escorted out, escorted out by security. The lucky ones would get a check. A generation of people who just months before had believed they could change the world now knew the hard truth that no one is indispensable in corporate America. And it just didn't seem to, to end. The dot-coms became the easy targets. They were silly, greedy, wasteful, irreverent. All those $2 million Super Bowl ads weren't funny anymore. They seemed grotesque. No one wanted to admit they too had gone to the weekly industry standard rooftop parties or bragged about making more money than their parents. In the aftermath of the bust, commuters on Highway 101 could see straight through the cavernous, excited home campus with its fluorescent lights still blazing but nothing inside. It got hate mail for wasting energy. Someone torched the Forbes billboard that proclaimed prolifer proliferate capitalism. Venture capitalists were easy targets too. As the financiers for all this, shouldn't they have known better? There was the sense they had just played a sophistica sophisticated game of hot potato with the American stockholder, pushing companies onto us before they knew were worthless and profiting before it all collapsed. In the wake of such anger, and perhaps their own embarrassment for maybe believing a bit too much in the hype, many venture capitalists decided not to talk to the press. Others would begin meetings with, we never really got the whole dot-com thing. The names of internet companies they funded were scrubbed from their websites along with some of the partners who funded them. All the people who believed the hardest in the bubbles were the one, ones who piled on the most derision. Worse than the lost money and the lost jobs was the fact that they had believed, that they all had gotten duped. It was a scam and they bought it. There was no new economy and all those naysayers they had thumbed their noses at now seemed to be right. 
The whole experience would have been a hell of a lot easier to swallow and recover from if so many people hadn't believed. Next time, they told themselves, next time they'd be wary. Is it any wonder then that Silicon Valley journalists, analysts, lawyers, and even venture capitalists start to have palpitations any time a web company gets some hype? No one was in the mood to believe again, even six years later. In some ways, that's what changed the most in Silicon Valley in the years after the bust. A few crucial ingredients have kept the Valley at the center of tech innovation for 40 years. One is more venture capital than anywhere else. The second is a critical mass of smart people, thanks to the area's preponderance of large high-tech companies and universities. A third is an infrastructure of attorneys, accountants, and publicists skilled at the guerrilla tactics necessary for starting something from scratch. The fourth, and most impossible to replicate elsewhere, is the culture of risk-taking. That's the only one of the four that really went away after 2000. The Valley was still awash in cash and smart people. Everyone was just scared to use them. Or almost everyone. This is the story of the guys who weren't. Um, so obviously, the, um, everyone at Google who was there at the time had a somewhat different experience. In the book, I talk a little bit about how Google was sort of one of these sandwich generation companies that was witnessing everything that was going on, but at the same time, living a different experience. And another famous example was PayPal. And a lot has been made of sort of this PayPal mafia and the degree to which it's really deeply played a role in almost every exciting Web 2.0 company that's come out. And you know, I talk a lot in the book, um, Max Levchin and Peter Thiel co-founded um, PayPal are, are both huge uh, characters, if you will, in the book. Um, and I, you know, I talk a lot about their experience because it was in some ways really counterintuitive. I mean, they were sort of just discarded even though they were the only ones to go public right after, you know, the bust in September 11th and have this great exit. And one of the um, people who really fascinated me about this was Max because he had had so much success but he was more miserable than anyone else and he got sort of caught up in this funk as well um, because he felt like he had just been a fluke and it was completely over and this huge defining thing of his career had gone by in such a blur and it was actually at a dinner with Max where I got the title for the book um, which I've heard several times in Silicon Valley but you know he everywhere he went every time he got introduced as the PayPal guy people would always say well you know you, we'll see if you do it again. That'll prove that you're good and not just lucky. So, you know, when I actually was starting out the narrative of the book, um, I wanted to delve into this aspect of Max, but because the book is written for people outside the valley, I didn't want to start the book proper with anything that had to do with venture capital, anything that had to do with technology. I, I'm trying to tell a real human story here, and so I wanted to start with something incredibly human people could relate to that would in a couple pages explain this crazy competitive drive that Max and so many web entrepreneurs have that seems so unbelievable to people on the West Coast who are always like, why don't these people retire and go sit on an island once they made money? So this is uh, from the very opening pages of the book. And I should say Max was somewhat horrified when he got the book and <laughs> read this was the opening. It was sort of a throwaway conversation we had one day. Max Levchin is afraid of the water. He hates this about himself. It's a sign of weakness, and for a guy who prides himself on an ability to code for days without sleeping, nothing is worse than being weak. He can't even admit it without backtracking immediately. I'm not really scared. I mean, I'm rational enough not to be scared of anything. I just get uncomfortable. Say he was thrown in the deep end of a pool. Logically, he knows he would be OK. He bikes 50 miles on any given weekend. He runs 10 miles a day. I could probably run a marathon tomorrow, he says matter-of-factly. Swimming a few yards to, s to safety? Yeah, he could physically handle it, obviously. But mentally, it's another story. As much as Max wishes, even sometimes pretends, it's not true. The simple act of putting his face underwater takes all the courage of facing a firing line. Since age nine, when his mother saved him from drowning in the Black Sea, he's tried not to think about it, let alone talk about it. That all ends today. It's November 5th, 2006, and Max is standing at the edge of the San Francisco Bay in a wetsuit, waiting for the bang of a starter's pistol. Some people might conquer a fear of swimming by getting in a pool, maybe going to the beach. Max is doing a triathlon. When his girlfriend Nellie did one a few months earlier, her goal was to come in at under 130 minutes. Max's goal is not to die. He's not merely uncomfortable, he's fucking scared. 
He stretches, psyching himself up. Anything not to dwell on that visceral memory when his snorkel filled with water and he ripped off his mask only to look up and see he was 10 feet below the water's surface and falling fast, watching, watching the shimmering disk of the sun getting dimmer and dimmer. By the time his mother grabbed him, he was half conscious. Loopy enough, she looked like a guy with a mustache. Nope, not thinking about it. I can do this, he tells himself. His jaw is locked. His intense, unflinching gaze is staring down his enemy. The starter's pistol fires and Max springs into action. This is the moment he becomes one step closer to invincible. He starts swimming, only to be seized immediately by panic. Why am I doing this? I don't have to prove anything to anyone. I have a really good excuse. He puts it out of his head and keeps swimming. If he can resist the urge to turn around and head for shore, he'll conquer this fear. He'll take control. He knows it. Max passes the first buoy on the course, and his limbs start feeling heavy. It occurs to him just how easy it would be to relax, slip down into the water, fall asleep. He looks at the rest of the course and isn't sure how he can make it. He panics again. This time it shows. A lifeguard in a kayak glides up to him, watching him closely. Max gets pissed. I don't need your help, he says to himself, and continues plowing through the water, stroke after stroke after stroke. The next 10 minutes are pure, macho, athletic force of will. If trying to conquer childhood trauma is too overwhelming, he'll just focus on proving this asshole wrong. As Max rounds the last buoy, he suddenly realizes he's going to make it. He's swimming. His intensity turns giddy. He starts laughing maniacally. He's laughing so hard he's inhaling water and then coughing it back up, but he can't stop. The lifeguard is still paddling alongside, only now eyeing Max like he's nuts. My, Max climbs out of the bay grinning. Just before he jumps on his custom-made titanium bicycle, he takes a moment. He feels something he doesn't often feel, satisfaction. I survived. Good job, Max. He knows his mom will call in a couple hours. She'd been dead set against all of this. They'd fought during his weeks of training in the lap pool at the gym, each day marked by that terrifying moment of shoving his head underwater. They'd even stopped talking about it for weeks leading up to the race. He smiles, thinking about it now. As Max turns back to gloat on his accomplishment, suddenly everything changes. He sees only a dozen people left in the water out of the hundred or so that started the race. Fuck, he thinks, I should have tried so much harder. He's so distracted by the idea that he bikes the next few minutes with his gloves still in his mouth. He bikes hard, he runs hard. He finishes the race at 126 minutes, a respectable time. He beat Nellie at least, but he knows it's not great. His mom calls almost immediately afterward. Are you okay? Yep. Did you swim? Yep. All the way? Yep. A pause and then, did you catch a cold? <laughs> Max takes a few days off and starts training for the more rigorous Escape from Alcatraz triathlon in April. The first time was all about survival, he says. Now I want to win. So the story pretty much sums up Max and anyone who made money during a bust. It's the sense of, wow, I got through that and now I've made money, now what? It's this really particular kind of midlife crisis that people in the Valley expect um, and go through. And so much of Max's story is, is all about you know, this misery and how working was the only thing that, that really pulled him out of it. And, and that's totally what's dominated his whole, um, his whole company at Slide. And, you know, honestly, it's one of the main reasons that I put Max in the book, because um, back in 2006, when I was picking the people that I thought would be interesting, um, I didn't really go by companies because, you know, as you guys know, companies in the Valley can change so quickly and the book wasn't going to come out until 2008. I really picked people based on the entrepreneurs themselves and who I knew had so much force of will that even if they had to completely change their company by now in 2008, they were still going to be relevant and still going to be in business. So at the time, Slide was a very unsexy company. It was so much controversial that I was starting the book with Max. And I think Max actually gets even more pages than Mark Zuckerberg, which was also somewhat controversial. Um, but it's really because of that, that attitude uh, that I did. Um, you know, another person that, that I really found fascinating was Mark Andreessen. And, Several years ago when I was at Business Week, I started really trying to build a relationship with Mark Andreessen. You know, as I said, I got here at the peak of the bubble and I felt like I'd really sort of missed out on the days that Mark Andreessen was first out here and this 22-year-old kid starting Netscape. And I was always fascinated with what it must have been like to be that guy 
who was that poster child for that huge thing that got created where, I mean, people were engulfed in the excitement of Silicon Valley globally in a way they never had before. You know, to be the 22-year-old kid on the front of Time magazine, um, to be the face of the modern IPO and, you know, that a Silicon Valley could go, company could go public with no revenues or, you know, business model that, you know, has still changed so much of how the Valley operates and then have so much hatred and derision just heaped down on you. I mean, I went back in Business Week's archives and read all the stuff about Mark Andreessen when he was starting Loud Cloud and when it went out and didn't have a good IPO and just how angry everyone was at him and how vitriolic it was. And so when I met him, he, um, he actually, and I write about this in the book, has a triple encrypted shit list on his computer of everyone that screwed him over. Um, <laughs> and it's actually very short, which I still write, because Mark's very thin-skinned. Um, it only has about 10 people on it. Two of the people on that list were from Business Week. So it was really, really hard for me to even get a meeting with Mark, much less gain his trust. And it was, you know, two years. I think it's starting like 2005 or so. It was like literally two years of Mark and I going to coffee at the creamery, and me asking him questions and him saying off the record, and then answering it in a really terse statement, and then just looking at me like there was no conversation to be had. And finally, by the time I was writing this book. We finally had gotten through all this, and I guess I had sort of proved, because he kept get, telling me all this great stuff that was off the record and I, can't, I couldn't use, and I never would. And so I think he finally felt like I'd passed his test and he could trust me. So he agreed to be in the book. And there's a section, um, there's a long chapter that, that is mostly about him in the middle of the book called Return of the King. That's all about his, his journey um, through you know, coming out to the valley, doing Netscape. Um, you know, literally starring in a Miller Lite commercial, which is so bizarre even to think about now. I mean, think about how huge Mark Zuckerberg is, and he's not in a Miller Lite commercial. I mean, Andreessen was just so the, this guy that everyone dreamed of being who was young and had a smart idea. And, um, you know, and then becoming this massive pariah. And, you know, because Mark didn't talk to anyone between the time of becoming a pariah to starting Ning and kind of being back out there, a lot of people didn't realize um, what had happened to him before. So I just want to read a real quick passage, which is you know about you know basically where he talks about that he lost all faith in the web, which a lot of people don't realize ever happened because he's so bullish on it now, and he was so bullish on it in the 90s, and what it took for him to start believing in it again. This um, comes in a part in the, check, the, the chapter where I talk about Mark having to be at the Web 2.0 conference in 2006 and how miserable he is to be there because he hates leaving Palo Alto and hates going anywhere. And he basically got extorted by John Battelle that Ning couldn't launch unless he was there. Um, so I say in that part that he's there because of Gina because she's launching the company, his co-founder. To say Mark is here because of Gina has a meaning beyond just the conference. Three years earlier, Gina convinced Mark the consumer internet wasn't dead. It wasn't any single meeting where the light bulb went off. For Mark to admit he's wrong, it takes far more than that. It was over the summer and fall of 2003. Mark had met Gina through her previous company, Harmonic Communications, funded by Sequoia Capital. Mark was on the board, and Gina quickly impressed him, even as the company stalled after the bust. Gina stands out in Silicon Valley, and not just because she has two X chromosomes. She's tall, stylish, and a scrappy brunette. She did the whole valley shtick of going to Stanford undergrad and business school and getting funding from Sequoia, but she rails against entrepreneurial posers. She calls herself a self-hating MBA. She starts companies because she doesn't have another choice, she says. She doesn't do it to be cool or make a quick buck. She's obsessed. And like many entrepreneurs, she's found herself at home in Silicon Valley. She grew up in Cupertino, just a few miles from Ning's headquarters, and although she doesn't elaborate, she says she can never go home. Andreessen is the same way. He hasn't talked to his family in years and hasn't been back to the Midwest in even longer. At his wedding, none of his relatives were present. He had in total about five people on his side of the aisle, including Ben Horowitz, a longtime friend, early Netscape co-worker, and co-founder of Mark's second company, LoudCloud. Michael Lovitz, the Hollywood power broker, was there too. He reportedly gave a disastrous toast, but no one will divulge the details. Perhaps this is the reason Mark and Gina just click. Harmonic Communications, however, did not click. It sold, us, it sold software for companies' marketing departments that aimed to help them do sophisticated advertising campaigns that would include the internet for the first time. Then, in 2000, the advertising recession, recession hit, and that was it for that business model, Mark says matter-of-factly. The company was sold for a lackluster amount in 2003 to Dentsu, a large Japanese advertising agency. 
Gina started to spend a lot of time doing consulting for Ovitz and other people Mark knew and hanging out with, and hanging out with early believers in social media like Reid Hoffman. She was tracking things like the convergence of media with high tech and overall internet adoption trends. During the bleak years between 2001 and 2004, she noticed all the numbers were growing fast. Internet use, broadband adoption, social networking traffic, internet advertising, revenues, even profits, everything. She'd meet with Mark regularly, showing him all the data and filling him in on very under the radar web companies that were raking in hundreds of millions of dollars a year, while conventional wisdom still said the industry was dead. Look, it's all working, she told him. The more they talked, the more Mark started to think, she's right, she's absolutely right. His second thought, very few people realize this. This was a huge reversal for Mark. It took courage to believe again after living through the incredibly wild ride of 95 to 2001. Mark is brilliant. He taught himself his first programming language at age nine from a library book, then got bored by computers until he first glimpsed the internet. But he's also highly emotional. He doesn't own any stocks of public companies, aside from his own companies, because he always buys high and sells low. Indeed, emotion caused him to sell many of his Netscape shares on the cheap. I fall for it every time, he says. My instincts are exactly wrong. I fall for the cover stories. I thought Enron was great. When everyone is pissed off or depressed, I'm the exact same way. So back in late 2000 and 2001, when the story of the day was the death of the internet, Mark bought it. I was just totally convinced the consumer internet was over, he says. It was tried and it failed. It's over. It's toast. I lived through the whole thing with Netscape, then AOL, then also with LoudCloud. There was just vast fear and loathing directed at the internet, and I was like, that's it. Mark says he was bummed. This is an understatement, given that Mark's entire fame, career, and wealth were all predicated on the power of the internet. Mark describes it in academic terms. I made the classic mistake of extrapolating from short-term trends. It's basic human psychology to keep us from being eaten by lions. If I see a lion over the hill, I'm going to assume five minutes later the lion is still there, that, because that's the only way to survive. In this case, the lion wasn't still there. And then there's a lot of great stuff in this chapter about him, him building Ning and building uh, Loud Cloud and sort of redeeming himself and, and feeling like he can kind of leave the house again because he's proved everyone wrong who said he couldn't make it without Jim Clark and Jim Barksdale. But, and when you talk to Mark now, he's just incredibly bullish on everything. I'll tell you everything's going to grow, I'll tell you everything's great, I'll tell you, you know, Ning is going to take over the world, and, you know, and he, it's very hard for him to say one thing that he's worried about now, but I finally, sort of at the end of interviewing him, found one little thing, and it, it ends this chapter. Thirteen years after he first arrived in Silicon Valley, Mark hasn't changed at all in some ways. When he talks about his triple encrypted files, he beams like the kid from University of Illinois who co-created Mosaic and set the world on fire. He still frequents the same places, the Peninsula Fountain and Grill and Copa Cafe in downtown Palo Alto, and of course Hobie's. He eats at Hobie's so much they've discussed putting his much customized usual on the menu and naming it after him. He eats there so much, two Hobie's employees once fought over which one of them could nominate him for customer of the year. But it's also a very different Mark Andreessen than the one who moved to the Valley in 94. He may not like meeting people, but he can be charming when he does. He spends money on clothes. He's fit. He loves cheeseburgers, but also eats sushi, something he once vowed he would never try. He no longer has to prove anything to anyone. That said, when Ning becomes a success, he'll be happy to take one hell of a victory lap before all those who doubted he could make it without Clark and Barksdale. All those investments in other hot startups are just more fodder to prove why, he, why he's still Silicon Valley's golden geek. Some early evidence. While people have been calling Mark a has-been, his net worth has grown nearly five-fold and is now worth north of $600 million. But in spite of Mark's confidence in the future, he's disturbed by one fact. Most of the fundamental breakthroughs in science, math, culture, music, or business came from people in their early 20s. He can't figure out why, but he's studied enough history to know there's some sort of correlation between young people and breakthroughs. He's also lived it. As far as I can tell, it's not because these people are particularly brilliant or unusual. It's because you know enough to actually produce something. You have enough of an education and training, he says, but you're so young you know little about what's been done before. You've not bought into the assumptions that exist in any field. 
By the time you're 35, you start to have a really good understanding of things that are possible to do and not to do. You, to have a fundamental breakthrough, you have to look at things so differently, different from how they've been looked at for the last 30 years. And once you have all that stuff in your head, that's hard. So while he's happy he's gained experience to know the good times always come back in the valley, the confidence to tell doubters they're flat wrong, and the money to do whatever he wants, Mark knows this knowledge may be a hindrance if he wants to truly change the world again. I'm not 22 anymore, I'm 35, he says. I think I'm having a lot more fun now than I did because I feel much more comfortable, but I do worry about that, a lot. At first he calls it the Mozart phenomenon, but soon he corrects himself, calling it by another name the Mark Zuckerberg phenomenon, which is the name of the following chapter. It's <laughs> um, Just like a couple other little things and then maybe we can do some questions if you guys have some. Um, I feel like I need to read something about Mark Zuckerberg, um, even though he's just written about to death and you guys may be completely sick of, of hearing him. Um, so maybe just uh, since this is Google and I work for Yahoo and like to piss them off, I'll read about the time Yahoo fucked up buying Facebook. <laughs> Um, <laughs> because he's such an enigma and a hermit, people always get Zuck, always get Zuck wrong. I have to call him Zuck. That was his fratty nickname when he was starting the company that everyone called him by. And interestingly, over the course of writing the book, he matured so much as a CEO that he really no longer goes by it. But I had too many marks in the book, so it stuck. <laughs> Because he's such an enigma and a hermit, people always get Zuck wrong. He's called arrogant and unwilling to listen to others. Others say he's in it for the money. That concept doesn't make sense to him. If you're motivated by money, what do you do after you make it? As he told Rolling Stone in 2006, what people don't get is I've already turned down more money than I could ever spend. This is not an exaggeration. Zuck leads a Spartan lifestyle. He doesn't have an alarm clock or much furniture and only recently got high-speed internet in his Palo Alto rental. He was so sick one day he couldn't make it into work and the dial-up connection drove him insane. And as the owner of approximately a third of Facebook, Zuck has already turned down hundreds of millions of dollars. A pivotal moment was June 2006 when Yahoo offered to buy Facebook for a billion dollars. One billion dollars. At the time, this seemed exorbitant for what most people thought of as just a so college social networking site. Yahoo needed something radical. It had weathered the bust and was one of the largest dot-com survivors, but Google was killing Yahoo in the most lucrative form of online advertising, paid search ads. While Google's stock soared past $400 a share, Yahoo was in Wall Street's doghouse. There was pressure on the company to do something big, and acquiring Facebook was as big as it got. As a founder, Mark is an odd combination of heart and mind. He navigates product strategy from his gut, but he navigates business strategy via a highly analytical measurement of users' growth, engagement, and other stats. Both argued against the deal. His gut was telling him he wasn't finished creating the site, his ultimate vision. His analytical mind was telling him a billion dollars was simply not enough. He saw how many people were using the site, how obsessively they were using it. He knew the company was worth more. He convened the board meeting to talk about the deal by glancing at his watch, looking at Peter and Jim, and saying, 8.30 seems about as good a time to turn down a billion dollars as any. He wasn't going to be some has-been Web 1.0 company's life raft. It wasn't part of his plan. Was he stupid? It just This is explained in an earlier chapter, but Mark owns three of five board seats at Facebook. So he can never be outvoted on the board. So to say that, it was absolutely his take, and they couldn't outvote him. Was he stupid? At the time, everyone thought so. One billion dollars is a lot of money. MySpace had sold for about half of that, and at the time, most people thought Fox had grossly overpaid. Google's 1.6 billion had reduced Chad and Steve to giggling teens. His board members were agog. This was a billion dollars Yahoo was talking about. Zuck and Peter spent six long hours debating about whether Facebook should even consider the deal. After all, Peter had sold his company to eBay. This was a dilemma he was familiar with, and while he wasn't pushing Zuck to sell, he wanted him to consider it. In PayPal's case, selling had been for the best. PayPal's future had been uncertain for a variety of legal reasons, and it was uncomfortably dependent on eBay for much of its customer base. Beyond that, everyone at the company made money and got to stay friends. And considering all the innovation that has emerged from the gang in Slide, Yelp, YouTube, LinkedIn, Genie, and others, selling was probably the best for the Valley, too. By the end of the conversation, Zuck was at least open to exploring a sale, which was all Peter asked. Then a few days later, Yahoo's stock sell by, fell by 20%, and it tried to discount the deal. That was it. No sale. 
This time, Peter and Zuck agreed. Even Breyer agreed. If it had been a clean billion dollar offer, I probably would have wanted to seriously consider it, he says. After all, his goal for Facebook had been 750 million, but the offer never came. Ultimately, they were wise to hold out. Yahoo had blown it, much like it blew the chance to buy Google for some three billion back before its IPO. And then just one more word on Mr. Zuckerberg. Um, that feeds into that. Where is that? Oh. Peter, and Peter I keep referring to is Peter Thiel, by the way. Peter Thiel has always had one central piece of advice for Zuck. Typically, only one or two elements truly matter when you're the CEO. The trick is finding out what those elements are. To Zuck, it's clear that one of them is not selling Facebook on the cheap. I fuck up all the time, he says. I fuck up all day long. But as long as I don't fuck up the big things, it's OK. Let's say Facebook could be worth $20 billion one day. If I had sold Facebook for a billion, I would have eroded a lot of value. That'd be a pretty big fuck up. Zuck even told Peter he shouldn't have sold PayPal. It's going to do $2 billion in revenue this year, and he sold it for $1.5 billion. This may be the most important reason for Zuck to run Facebook, for his own good, for the company's good, for his investors' good, and the good of Silicon Valley. He won't sell. Is it because he's cocky enough to believe Facebook can't possibly stumble, naive enough to think markets and external forces can't be controlled, ego-driven enough to think he can build the next Google, or is it just some doing something so useful, so cool, that anything else would pale in comparison? It's likely a combination of all of them. It's the same ludicrous cocktail of ambition, delusion, and emotion that's resulted in most of the giants of the high-tech world, not to mention the technology that runs our everyday lives. The giants of Silicon Valley all had a chance to sell out at some point for what seemed a huge amount of money, an amount that would be stupid to turn down, but they turned it down anyway. Every decade, a handful of truly great companies come out of the valley. If people did the rational thing, taking the money, that wouldn't happen. Someone has to believe. Someone has to say no. Maybe that's the key to the so-called Mark Zuckerberg phenomenon. Why so many of the largest Silicon Valley companies come from young guys in their 20s. They haven't learned yet that when someone offers you a billion dollars, you should probably say yes. So I think I'll stop there and see if anyone has any questions. As you can see, it just sort of ties everyone's stories and a narrative that just takes you through what everyone's done. And there's a couple of chapters about how sort of fundamentally the venture capital markets have changed and the ad markets have changed and the role that you know Google has played in that. Um, but um, mostly it's a story about the people. So any questions? And if you do have questions, if you could please use the mic. Do you want me to read more? I'm going to read more if you don't ask me questions. <laughs> so of the, the people that you do speak about, because Slide and Ning are still open questions in many ways, mm -hmm. who hasn't been lucky? Who has had duplicative success that justifies and, and reinforces their... Well, the quest is about these people's role to play lucky, to be lucky. So, you know, the only person in the book who you can say that about is Mark Andreessen, because over the course of writing the book, he sold Opsware for $1.6 to HP. So he had Netscape and then Opsware. And, you know, by making it, I mean, I draw the sort of arbitrary billion dollar line. I mean, because that's what most of these guys aim for, is building something that's worth at least a billion dollars. So, you know, a lot of it, uh, you know, remains to be seen. I mean, on paper, Slide um, is worth more than 500 million. So on paper, Max is what, you know, half the way to, or a third of the way to beating PayPal, half the way to doing a second one. Um, on paper, Ning, I think its last round is, was about 500 million. So, you know, Mark is the third of the way there, which um, the only other person I know who's done that in the Valley is Jim Clark. So that would have a lot of meaning for him. Um, and a lot of the other guys were, uh, you know, Mark is obviously, Mark Zuckerberg is obviously a little bit of an outlier since this is his first time, but which is why he sort of comes into the book later, um, despite him being, you know, one of the more buzzed about people in the Valley. But Mark is still really emblematic of this wave of companies because he early up tied up with Peter and with Sean Parker, who related to him so much of the scars that they had from the bubble that Facebook was almost structured like it was, a, you know, a second time around company. I mean, the fact that there's three people on the board and Mark has three seats, the fact that he was managed to retain 30% of the company, he sort of inherited a lot of those learnings. Um, but, you know, it's hard to do it twice. There's, you know, I think you can count on two hands the people who've done it. So, 
it's, it's still in progress. I'm happy to say that everyone I focused on in the book, though, is still in business and is still grown and still kicking. So hopefully they'll prove me right. And that'll just be an opportunity to sell more books. <laughs> Thanks. Of uh, the guys and the companies that you've written about, mm -hmm. what are you most skeptical about in terms of their success down the road who have held out and haven't sold? Well, the ones that I, that I didn't read you any passages about was about Dig. And, I mean, they're definitely the, the ones I'm most skepti skeptical about. Um, Why is that? Well, a part of it is the way that um, they structured their company. Um, you know, while Max is an example of someone who had a lot of great success and had this pressure to do it again, but had all this sort of money and opportunity and wind at his back, um, Jay Adelson, who co-founded Dig with Kevin, was incredibly burned by Equinix. And there's a chapter in the book called Fuck the Sweater Vest that's about <laughs> Jay and his experience at Equinix and why he got so burned and so upset. And he left Silicon Valley and said he would never come back and, you know, was is more sort of the everyman of what happened to people. And he did because he's he's an entrepreneur and he has this constant tug of war in his heart between wanting to start new things and not wanting to set himself up for heartbreak again. I mean, he lost $60 million that he made. He hired the CEO who ousted him and took back control of the company. I mean, it was just sort of one indignity after another. He actually got an early uh, form of arthritis that's really painful and he was in, on bed rest for a year because it was so stressful and upsetting. Um, so because there's always been a debate within Dig about how much Jay's experience has helped the company and how much it's hindered the company. And I think in the early days, it was a huge help. They built it for a very lean amount. You know, they were also able to hold on to a huge amount of control, a huge amount of ownership. But they also never built an outside sales force. They were very hesitant hiring. They were hesitant to really being aggressive, just take over and taking over, you know, doubling down whenever they had success. And, you know, I think that you, they've pretty much managed the company for sale. I mean, neither one of those guys have this dream or ambition of taking that company public. So while I think that, you know, they're the most likely to sell in the book and they'll probably have the smallest exit of everyone I wrote about, I, I don't necessarily think it's because of their idea or their ability. Mm -hmm. It's because they've been their own worst enemies. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And they are still speaking to me, <laughs> or at least Jay is. Thanks for coming to uh, speak to us about your book. Um, I had heard that some of the PayPal folks were regretting having sold to eBay at the price they did. You mentioned that mm -hmm. in one of your last readings. Um, so on the one hand, um, you know, maybe the company would be worth a lot more, notwithstanding right. eBay resources. But on the other hand, I gave them kind of time and some money and a forcing function to be creative and do things new. Do you think the desire for them to maybe prove that they're good and not lucky is the common thread among some of the PayPal alums? And can you speak to that at all in your dealings with them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's that's the big thing with the PayPal guys. I mean, um, you know, I talked about a little bit in the part that I read from the, um, the prologue that you know, in my mind, what the Valley really lost was this sense of optimism. And I think that, you know, I probably put Google in this category as well, but I think the PayPal people, because of their timing of going public when they did, were really one of the only groups that were in the middle of the crash, but it wasn't affecting them. And like, there's this whole long part in the book, and there's actually some pictures in the middle of the book of PayPal's IPO party, and how weird and anachronistic that was. I mean, it was sort of this typical crazy IPO party where they're like, doing keg stands and they're um, and they're hitting at a like dollar sign pinata and watching the ticker go up and it's everyone around them is getting laid off and out of work and it's almost like they can't leave and even talk about it and so they got to learn a lot of lessons from the bust and that everything could vanish immediately but they also really had the sense that if you work really, really hard, you can still build a great web company. So they were some of the earliest guys. They were some of the only guys in the book that really set out to build businesses when they started their next ventures. And it wasn't just something like Dig or, um, or Facebook or LiveJournal or Six Apart, where it was just sort of people wanting to start something because they wanted that property to exist and then had to grapple with it becoming a business and whether or not they wanted to run it. Um, all the PayPal guys really had a mission to start a business and they're some of the only ones that want to take a company public, want to prove they can do it. You know, when it comes to like the Yelp guys, I think you know they want to prove they can do it with you know they can do what Max and Peter did. Um, when it comes to Max, he needs to prove it again. Peter and Max are in a race to see who can become a billionaire fastest and 
probably Peter's going to win, given his stake in Facebook alone. Um, but that's, yeah, I mean, they feel like there's so many people who are so mad at them for being the company that didn't crater that everyone's told them they were lucky over and over again, almost more than any other company. So I think that's a huge thing. Did you have a question? You know, I was just wondering about. Oh, wait, you're supposed to write the microphone. Yeah, I don't, and I don't know if you flip. Oh, sorry. I don't know if you if you flip back and looked at some of the earlier entrepreneurs because mm -hmm. you know it used to be there was Scott McNeely and Larry Ellison right. and you know most of the rest of those guys we could name. You know the Hewlett Packard. Those guys are have all retired. But you think about Larry Ellison and somebody like him who's held on to his company yeah. so long. Yeah. Where most everybody's gotten thrown yeah. out. I mean, Steve yeah. Jobs yeah. got yeah. thrown out in his back. Larry's end. the only one. He's the only one left. I think Scott is actually, oh, this, his company isn't doing, although I'm not even sure if he's still CEO. Didn't he step he's not down? CEO, yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. He's just, is he still and, on the board? Uh, I don't know if he's still yeah. on the board. Yeah, so it's pretty I, much Larry, Jeff, right? Jeff Bezos is the only other one, but yeah, he hasn't done it one. as long as Larry, or yeah. he go through quite, but yeah, Larry's pretty much the only one. I actually did a blog post recently when the Forbes, you know, richest, wealthiest, or not wealthiest, the, um, highest paid CEOs mm -hmm. came out and it was and Larry was the highest one in tech and I argued that he should be I mean yeah. I don't know anyone else who founded a company has led it through so many waves and Larry's also had an amazing ability to know where the business is going from a technology point of view and a market financial point of view and that to me is one of the reasons founders don't do it I mean you know look at what Jerry Yang is going through with Yahoo I mean being brought back in he obviously feels very passionately about that business and you know, I was at D last week, and he was asked why he's the guy to lead Yahoo. And everyone thought it was a completely rational question. If you think about it, that's kind of a crazy question. I mean, Jerry Yang built what is the biggest internet property. Who, who else would be qualified to run it if not him? But here we are in a situation where we're all asking the question, is he the guy to run it? Simply because that visionary aspect, that consumer aspect, that advertising aspect, that Wall Street aspect, those are all really, really hard things for, for one guy to have. And I think it's fragmenting even more in this generation of web guys. You know, another guy I spent a lot of time talking about is Evan Williams, who started Blogger and Twitter. And both Evan and Kevin Rose are, to me, sort of the prototypical web 2.0 entrepreneur in that they're, they have no interest to take a company public, ever. Mm -hmm. And that was the Silicon Valley dream for you know as long as we can all remember. They had absolutely no interest in that. They don't want to be CEO. They don't want to manage anyone. They want to come up with cool ideas. They almost see themselves more as like um, film studio heads that are kind of doing product after product and like the marketing and like all that. And because the web has gotten so broad and so consumer and it's almost less high tech, I think you have more and more of those people. I think I started speaking in the middle of your question though I'm sorry did you have a question or is that okay. okay I was just wondering about the comparison about yeah. you know, what makes Larry tick versus what makes them tick and I think you're right I think that's the common thread and it'll be interesting to see who actually has the Larry gene right really take something yeah. for you know, right. 20 years and hang on to it right and I think um, you know probably the closest people in the book I would say Max does because he's he's just so obsessed and driven by what he wants to do. And I would say, you know, Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, the problem with Zuck is Facebook has to get so big that it can go out. It can go out in the way Google went out so that he can stay in control because he's so young and he's in so many ways so bad at being a CEO. I mean, not in-house, but externally. Um, and I think, uh, you know, one other difference between um, Mark and Zuckerberg, I mean, Max and, and Zuckerberg, is you tend to have two types of companies in the Valley. You have the companies that are really, I mean, people outside the Valley are about innovation, but you have the companies that are really, truly innovative, that seize on something and start something completely new. And then you have the companies who aren't particularly innovative, but are just brilliant executors. Like, and, yeah. well, I would say Google, frankly. I mean, search was mm -hmm. done before. Google did it better. Um, oh, you know, Yahoo actually had come up with a str the ad strategy. Google did it better. Think of the products Google that you know you love. I love Gmail. It's not like email was done for the first time, but Google just did it better and from another direction. I think that's the kind of entrepreneur Max is. Um, there's a lot of stuff in Slide about how basically time after time, Slide has ripped off everything Rocky was doing and just done it way better and is way bigger and is valued at, you know, hundreds of millions more. I think Zuckerberg is more the real visionary guy 
and execution is, you know, is still a problem. And they've been on a big upswing, but there are definitely stress fractures in that company. And you know, at some point, they're going to stumble like anyone else does. And I think that'll be the real test for him as a CEO. But I'd say the first time I met Zuckerberg, I thought he was a ridiculous train wreck. And I was like, this is, <laughs> of all the obnoxious entrepreneurs I've met with, this is the most obnoxious one I've ever, ever met. <laughs> and over, you know, that was, I think, when he was 19 or 20. And I think over, uh, over the years, I've actually come to think he's actually a very good CEO, and I've been really impressed with, with how much he's changed over the course of the company. Any other questions? Come back there. Thanks. I was, um, you had some really flattering things to say about Google. I'm curious to think what we should be paranoid about. What do you think the weaknesses of the company are? Well, I think the biggest thing with Google, and I think this can't be overstated, is you know the degree to which you have one really great revenue stream and not a second one. And if you look over time at every, I mean, when I was covering software at Business Week, there were all these kind of walking dead mid-sized software companies like BEA or Novell or you know, all these companies that were once so great and seemed like no one would ever, ever beat them. And they missed getting that second big thing. And by the time they realized it, it was too late. And I, you know, I think that Google's you know, management is, is, I'm sure, smart enough that they're working on that. I mean, obviously, the acquisition of YouTube was a key moment that Google isn't just really cocky because they accepted that Google Video, you know, was not going to overtake YouTube and paid, you know, moved fast to get it, um, which is obviously something Yahoo could not do with Facebook, um, an example. But, you know, it's Peter Thiel points out something interesting in the book that um, every for every internet company that's been the publicly held darling of the world. It's never stayed that way for more than four years, whether it was Netscape, whether it was Yahoo, whether it was eBay. And now it's Google. And guess what? We're about approaching four years. So Peter's estimation is Google's run is about over. And you know, I think you could find a lot of things to say. Maybe that's true. And it's not that the company is going to just you know, go away and crater. It's that you know, when you're a publicly held company, people just get addicted to what I call like Barbie doll metrics. Like, you know, how people say if like a Barbie was a real woman, she like couldn't stand up or walk. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the things that Wall Street wants to see Google continuing to do year after year after year after even getting bigger are not possible. Are not possible. And so there's inevitably a point where it's going to start turning the other way. And I, Peter's other point of of why this happens in four-year cycles is that by that time, so many people have vested and left. And if you consider the engineering talent and the people to be the, the only real fixed asset of an internet company, once those people are gone, you're never going to get the same quality of people. And it's just going to be a downward slide from there on out. So I don't know. We can see if Google will uh, break the four-year curse. And uh, you know, I'll be first to give Google credit if they do it. But I don't know. I, I mean, I, I'm not allowed to help hold any uh, stocks in tech companies since I, I cover all of them. But if I had stock in Google, I would have started selling it late last year. <laughs> is, that, is that offensive enough? Did I, did I so on that <laughs> note, my, my positive thing <laughs> words about Google? <laughs> Are there any other questions? I think um, we've almost reached one? time. We have time for one more. Sure. I think I have the timing right. Did you Twitter about how you were nervous about this um, coming to this reading today? Yeah, I did. OK. I was just curious about what you thought might happen, and did we live up to it? Oh, no. <laughs> no, I think um, it was just that I've lived with the book so long, and this is like my first real reading. And it's like, I, I don't know what people want to hear about. I mean, I was, I was telling Nick that it's almost easier to do press and you know readings and talk about the book to people totally outside Silicon Valley, because that's you know, I mean, not that people in the Valley can't read it and enjoy it, but it's really written for people who just have absolutely no idea how any of this stuff works. Because it's, I think it's a book that anticipates a lot of questions people feel are, are dumb questions and explains it. So I've done so much national press that I've gotten in that mode of really talking to people who don't know anything about anything. That then coming you know, to Google, which is obviously an incredibly sophisticated company, it's like, I don't want to bore people. I didn't know it passed its because I didn't want to bore people or I didn't want to whatever. Also, funny anecdote, when we were working on the book, 
I was talking to um, Dick Costolo, you know, who sold Feed Burner to Google, and he was like, "Oh, you've got to come do a reading at Google. It'd be so great. I'll call some people. I'll make it happen." And he came back to me and said, "Oh, they have no interest in you because they think they know everything about Web 2.0." And I was like, "Really?" <laughs> so I guess probably that was in the back of my mind as well. Also, I have a horrendous cold, so I was hoping I could get through it without coughing. <laughs> Thank you. I think we've reached time, and thanks very much for coming, and I think you're going to be able to stay for a little while to sign some books. Yeah. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.